This morning's sermon is going to be one that we would classify <clears throat> in the area of the fundamentals or the first principles. If you become a Christian and all that the Bible defines Christian to mean, then certainly you would want to know what is acceptable worship. Now for those in the church who've been around a while, you have heard sermons like this. I don't claim for it to be anything new. But I do know also it's good for us who have known these things for years to have them renewed in our minds as we make personal application of these truths regarding our worship. You know, we can be in an assembly as we are now this morning. And people all around us, because we all worship individually, be worshiping acceptably, but yet somebody down the pew may not be, or I may not be, if I do not follow the teaching of the Lord concerning what is acceptable to Him. Uh, I have recently several times referred to Cain and Abel. Cain, the worship, was not acceptable to God. Did he worship? Yes, he did according to the patriarchal age. But it was not acceptable to God. Abel worshipped. It was acceptable to God. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice by Cain. And it says by it he had a good report. Well, that means he was living right when it came to that aspect of his life in his worship to God in that long ago age of patriarchy. What we shall do today is turn to John chapter 4 and see our lesson develop when it comes to the matter of of the Samaritan woman, <coughs> woman at the well. In verse 24, we'll skip some things there, we see our primary interest. God is spirit, and they that worship him must. Let that sink in. M-U-S-D, must. Worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, let's look at the must first. That's obligatory. If you're to worship God acceptably, then it must be in spirit and in truth, whatever it means to worship God in spirit and in truth. So notice first of all in this matter of fundamentals in worship that Jesus declared that our worship must be directed to God. All of this in the very context of it here has to do with man worshiping God. Notice in this that only deity is worthy of worship. One of the songs we sang a moment ago, Holy, Holy, Holy. That, of course, ascribes holiness to God. He's the only one that is holy. And so we worship God. Men are unworthy of worship, though there are people who sometimes are called worshipful master. Or, as in some religions, such as Roman Catholicism, they will bow and kiss the ring and worship the Pope. But that's not what we learn from the Scriptures, and we're interested in what the Scriptures teach, not what some human teaches. Cornelius knew that the Apostle Peter had been sent by God for a specific purpose, and that was to tell him the truth, to teach the gospel to preach the word of God to him. Which, if it is obeyed, Hebrews 5 and verse number 9, he and his household would be saved. Such is recorded by Luke in Acts chapter 11 and verse 14. Now, what happens? When Cornelius first saw the apostle Peter, Luke tells us that he fell down at his feet and worshiped him, Acts 10 and verse 25. Now notice he fell down at his feet. The idea and the word most used, let me say here, in the Greek language is proskuneo, or a form of it. And it's to kiss the hand toward. It is to fall prostrate, as it were, in an act of obeisance to another. So when it comes to spiritual matters, 
God has instructed us in how, if you please, to kiss the hand toward or to fall prostrate before him to engage in acts of worship. Notice that in our case today in the worship of God, it's not just sitting there silent in your minds worshiping God. The worship of God today demands acts of worship. Peter was an apostle of Christ. Thus, he enjoyed the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit. Through him and the other apostles and those they laid hands on to confirm miraculous gifts, the New Testament was written. And he made it clear that men were unworthy of worship. Notice what he does when it comes to Cornelius falling at his feet. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up. I myself also am a man. Acts 10, 26. When you come to the end of the New Testament, thus the end of the Bible, John is the apostle, and he's so astounded at certain things and overcome that at times he does things he ordinarily would not. And in Revelation 19, verse 10, and chapter 22, verse 9, twice before angels he fell down and he worshiped. But the angels themselves said, we're servants of God, and told them plainly, the only one to be worshipped is God. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by the devil himself, he responded to the devil when the devil wanted him to fall down and worship Satan. He stated, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Matthew 14. Now you can't get plainer than that. So who do we worship today? Well, if an object of worship is right, then it must be God. That causes me to want to understand the revelation of God concerning God and the things that pertain to many things having to do with being faithful to God as we live this life. The next point we want to note, second, we observe that man is the one who has a responsibility in this case of worshiping God. It always bothers me, it has all my life as a preacher. And just as a Christian, period, to see those who say, I'm a Christian, and yet they do not worship God. Now, in the previous verse, Jesus had stated, For the Father seeketh such to worship him, John 4 23. That is, those who worship him in spirit and in truth. It's clearly, or I think it's clearly set out in this passage, John 4, 23, for the Father seeketh such to worship him, that God desires worship from man. He wants man to realize what God is and why he should worship him. And the primary purpose of man, and this should anchor us as members of the Lord's church and all that that means, is to glorify God. I have no business doing anything that does not glorify God. And Paul addressed this if he was the one that was inspired to write the book of Hebrews. At least inspiration says in Hebrews 13, 5, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are more created. That is where John wrote in Revelation 4.11. Now Paul, if he wrote it, said by him, Therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of the lips, giving thanks to his name. Now there are two passages from the Apostle John, the last book of the Bible, and Paul, if so be he wrote it, the book of Hebrews. So it's obvious it's serious business. Now what does that imply concerning our assemblies of worship? When we come together, as we admonish to do so in 1 Corinthians 11, we come together to worship God. Well, we worship collectively because there's a fellowship between us as brothers and sisters in Christ, worshiping God as the Word of God prescribes. But that means that each one of us must be doing our part. 
We need, as is the case of everything pertaining to living the Christian life, to train our minds to think of what they ought to be thinking about. And for each one of us, being mindful of the fact, we should be trying to create an atmosphere where that's more easily done. So much of what happens today, and it happens even in the Lord's church, and has for some time, is done to benefit whatever entertains man. And there's liable to be anything going on in a worship service, and it is most of the time. If you look around about you at what you see on television or in these churches, there's everything. It's, it's like a three-ring circus. That's all done for the benefit of man. But the worship which the Lord prescribes as we're gathered in now is for the benefit of God. In that we from the heart worship Him, as Jesus said, in spirit and in truth. So we must create an atmosphere by our own attitude and conduct, which means training children, training ourselves as to our conduct. We have come collectively before the God of all glory. You know, he's not just in every place in the sense that he is with us intimately. When we as New Testament Christians, his children, have come before him in an assembly specifically designed to worship him, to extol him. To glorify Him, coming from the very inward being of our lives. You noticed in the song we sang a moment ago, and I didn't ask Him to sing this, but it talked about God or Christ redeeming us. That's one of the things we need to think about. It should be when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're thinking about redemption. Well, what did it cost to save David Brown from his sins? It costs Christ's life. So we have done right the opposite in the worship. And I say we, I mean throughout the religious world, claiming God is worshipped and Christ is the Son of God. We've turned it into some sort of jamboree. It's not holy. It's not reverent. It's not something that causes us to be able to meditate and think about God and think about ourselves and a lot of God's Word. But we as Christians in such an assembly as Hebrews 10, 25, are expected to have our minds centered on Jesus. We sing that song sometimes to our little folks. Where was your mind centered on Jesus? Well, I think sometimes it's where, where's your mind? It's centered on a phone. It's centered on maybe popcorn or it's centered on what we're going to do afterward. It's centered on something, but it's not centered on Jesus, His Word and my life before Him and extolling Him in acts of worship. So there's one thing we can do in our fellowship and the worship is help create an atmosphere wherein God is worshipped. Third point is that our worship must be in spirit. Now that's a must. It's imperative. Jesus said so. That settles it whether you believe it or not. So we're to worship God. Jesus described some who offered such worship. Notice what he said about the Jews who thought they were the very epitome of what God wanted on this earth. The people, this people draweth nigh unto me with their lips, or with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips. But what did he say? But their heart is far from me. So you can then engage in vain worship, can't you? You can go through, as we're like, I want to say sometimes, you can go through the motions. You can look like you're doing what God said do, but where's your heart? Where's your mind? It's the reason I say it takes discipline to learn to worship. It takes training, doing things over and over again like they ought to be done for the reason they ought to be done, to worship God. When I was in the long years ago in the high school band, First of all, the director had to realize what we were capable of playing. And I remember sometimes he'd be presenting new music. He would try out several. Some, it was obvious, the band wasn't going to perform very well. But he would, in his trial and error process, finally find those songs that we could do. And uh, we had to, for marching season, then memorize those songs because he didn't want us looking at the music out there on the field. <laughs> then we would go before him and play the music 
And we had to do all that before school started because the band's always assembling in August so it could get its marching down and the rusty gaps out and the new people in it to march and to play and all those things. So we would really look good and be a representative of the school halftime in the football games. That was really important. Now think about that when it comes to the Christian and all that means. And seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto us. Matthew 6.33. Once he had selected the songs, then we would play them and play them until it was running out of your ears. Literally almost. The same thing would happen when the football season was over. And you had concert season. He'd go through various songs. He had finally realized, well, they can do these real well. And so we stuck, and we played them over and over again. I don't know how many times until he allowed us to have a concert. And even then, many times, that was done before the school assembly, before we ever did it for a public assembly. It's practice and training and training and practice, and all of that just to be able to put your best foot forward as a band before the people that are coming to listen to you. We have come together in this assembly. If we're here for the reason the Bible says we ought to be here, to present our acts of worship to the God of all the earth. And we are special if we are children of God and all that the Bible says members of the church are as children of the living God. As I've said many times, there are few of us on this earth, comparatively speaking. And we should, as individual Christians, do all we can in every aspect of living the Christian life. But now I'm talking about the worship. Prepare ourselves outside the worship to do what is required of us in the worship. If we worship God, Jesus said, it's a must that you do these things. It's obligatory. It's vain worship if you don't. I will not accept it. You might as well be Cain. That's exactly what's being said. This people draweth nigh to me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Matthew 15, 8. So you practice and you work at it and you rebuke yourself and you scold yourself, and you pray about it, and you study all you can so your mind will be where the acts of worship are, and it will be in spirit coming from your heart and in truth. So Scripture speaks of those who did not have acceptable worship. And those were the ones who thought they were the very epitome of what God wanted in the Jews, but it was vain worship. So Scripture speaks of those who are acceptable to God as notice. And he said this to Timothy. So Timothy's to know this for himself and teach it to the brethren because he's a preacher. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22. As them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now we heard something in a sermon not long ago about a pure heart. So part of having a pure heart before God is worshiping God out of that heart, out of that inward man in spirit. So worship is to be a sincere expression of praise. An adoration of God, which come from the genuine thoughts and intents of the heart. But of course, sincerity is not all that's necessary to make worship acceptable to God. You can be sincere and be wrong, because we must be following the authorized will of heaven. God knows how He wants to be worshiped, we're His servants. So we're interested in worshiping him like he wants to be worshiped. You know, it'd be hard to have a servant who said, you're supposed to be there doing what I want you to do and the way I want you to do it. But he decides that you'd like this better. And so he goes in and does as he pleases. And then when he's called out on it, he says, well, I just thought this would be better than it would be the other way. People approach God like that all the time. Great many who say, oh, God's so wonderful and loving and Jesus is my Savior. But do they ever really study his word closely enough to see what he wants? Fourth point we want to make is acceptable worship, and we've touched on it already, is in truth. 
made a statement this morning in class, and I've said it one way or the other all my life, and here many, many, many times, that truth ought to be the very foundation of all that we think and are, the truth of God's Word. And John 17, 17 says God's Word is truth. Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. So our worship must be according to God's instructions. So when men inject their own ideas into worship, then that becomes worthless worship. It becomes vain worship. The idea of vain is pointless, worthless. And here's what Jesus had to say about that. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, Matthew 15, 9. Now, he didn't say they were not worshiping me. He said they are worshiping me, but it's not doing them any good. It's vain worship. I don't take note of it. I'm opposed to it. Because it's the way men want to do things. And the denominational world is full of that kind of stuff. Or there wouldn't be a denominational world. Don't you realize that denominationalism is designed so that people can have their own way? Do things like they want to? Well, that's not so concerning the teaching of the New Testament. And may I remind you, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day. Don't you think that covers worship? If it doesn't, what else is left out? So there are certain acts of worship that God has approved. I'm interested in what he approves. I long ago ceased to be interested in seeking the approval of man, whether it be my brethren or anybody else, when it comes to violating the will of heaven, and disobeying him. All other acts are thereby condemned if they're not authorized in the worship of God, or in our day-to-day -day service. Well, in the study of the totality of the New Testament of Christ concerning worship, then I mentioned earlier that worshiping Him involves acts of worship coming from the proper attitude of the mind. And when you study the worship of Christians in the New Testament in the infallible book divine, Prayer is one of those acts of worship. Acts 2.42 says they continued steadfastly in prayer. James instructs us on proper prayer. James 4.8 and chapter 5 and verse 16. It talks about the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Righteous man is one that's faithful to God. He's doing the will of heaven as a Christian. Thus, he's following the teaching of the New Testament concerning the attitude one should have in worship, and especially this item of worship, this act of worship, which is a petition to our Heavenly Father. The Bible instructs us on that. So prayer is one of the acts of worship, and we're taught to be praying regularly. Then there's singing. If you look at every scripture in the New Testament of Christ, concerning the kind of music whereby God wants to be worshipped, you'll see it's singing. And we have two of those prime verses, Ephesians 5, 19 and Colossians 3, verse 16. And it talks about worshipping Him in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now those are the songs specified by the Holy Spirit. It's to be used in the worship of God. We're to sing those psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. And since worship's in spirit and in truth, it's coming from the heart, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in the heart to the Lord. The strings that are plucked there are the heart strings that would be worshiping in spirit as we sing these words that admonish one another and teach us. In fact, when you're singing, you're directing all that worship to the Heavenly Father, but in the case of this singing, it's obvious we're teaching and admonishing one another as we direct all worship to God. One of the other things that's to be done is the giving of our financial powers to give. Giving of our means on the first day of the week. Such as taught clearly in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2. Now I might point out that doesn't rule out, according to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, individually doing things during the week when opportunity comes your way. But why was there ever a collection taken up? So that it would be there for the church to use when an opportunity came by to do good unto all men, especially those household faith. Paul simply said, it's there and you've given it on the first day of the week. 
that there be no gatherings when I come. I'm coming to pick up your contribution to the poor saints in Jerusalem. Now go ahead and do this, and there won't be any rush around to try to have that done when I get there. Of course, all other aspects of the teaching of the New Testament concerning the church and finances are to be followed. But that's one of the acts we do, and we plan during the week what we're going to give on the first day of the week in the worship assembly of the saints. That's the point of 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. We're to give cheerfully and without grudging, for God loves a cheerful giver. So then we ought to be thinking about that, the light of all the rest of the teaching of the Bible concerning putting God first in our actions, Matthew 6, 33. Another act of worship is the observance or the partaking of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. We follow that as an example when to give, or rather when to observe the Lord's Supper because Paul told those people in Chores, uh, in Troas, he was an apostle inspired of the Spirit. He taught them how to worship God properly. He taught them how to worship God in spirit and in truth. And one of those acts of worship was the observance of the Lord's Supper. And we see that the bread represents them, the body of Christ offered in our stead. Christ knew no sin, though he was tempted in every point like as we are. And thus we remember that body crucified on the cross that was offered in our stead as a sacrifice for sin. The bread represents that. And so the fruit of the vine represents the shed blood of the Christ that was shed for the remission of sins. Paul reiterated that in 1 Corinthians 11 concerning the simplicity of the Lord's Supper. And yet there are acts involved. One commemorating the body of Christ, the other commemorating the blood of Christ shed for the remission of our sins, shed to purchase the church, Acts 20 and verse 28. Now, not just one of those is acceptable, not just two of them, not just three of them, and so on, but it's all of them. If you worship God acceptably in the assembly of the saint, now watch it, on the first day of the week, you will engage in every one of those. We've already studied the attitude of the heart. So when each one comes up, whether it's prayer, singing, preaching God's word, uh, giving financially or partaking, we ought to be thinking about what we're doing. And nobody is going to really give like they ought to give their financial means if they don't think about it before they ever get there to Sunday and then they go to grabbing for the pocketbook or whatever it is and throw whatever's there around. Of course, some of them don't even do that. I remember seeing, I don't know whether it was the Three Stooges or somebody else one time, they passed the plate and as it came by, they just thumped the plate on the bottom like they dropped their coin in. Well, that doesn't surprise me at all, how some people think along that line. And then some people just like the sound of nothing. Have you ever heard the song, The Sound of Silence? Well, when that place passes some people, it's the sound of silence. There's nothing drops in it. And they think, but I love the Lord. You do. It should be clearly observed that acceptable worship, acceptable to who? Acceptable to God is not everything that man might want to do and then until I call it worship. I heard one person say, well, it's my calling because of my gift to be able to play the piano. I offer that to God. Where is your authority in the New Testament to even think that way? How do you know the will of God on that? Do you study your Bible at all to even learn that and anything else? Maybe somebody else thinks, well, I fry eggs better than anybody else, so I'm frying eggs of the glory of God. I read one fellow here some years ago. He was a gymnast, and he had got up something called Gymnastics for Christ. Now, where do people come up with ideas like that? They certainly don't get it from the text of the Scriptures, but it'll be the text of the Scriptures that judges us on the day of judgment. Not what somebody else likes or somebody else thinks. The Bible's full of that material and it should be understood. So acceptable worship follows the parameters set forth by God and His Word. We wouldn't know anything about Jesus if it wasn't for His Word. We wouldn't know anything about God as far as knowing His will without His Word. Everything else that is not according to the authoritative Word is not acceptable to God. I don't care how many people do it. You know, we just don't count noses as to determining what's right and wrong when it comes to service to God. So regardless of what man may call it, when it comes to worship in music, playing a mechanical instrument of music, whistling or stomping your feet, we should think about that when we're training our little folks in the songs, 
because we wouldn't do that in the regular worship, but we certainly put up with it with the little ones. Or some other kind of music is not at worship because God in the New Testament has not authorized it. Needless, should I point you to Colossians 3.17? Even if man suggests that burning incense is worship, well, it's not. You may have it in your mind. There's no authority in the New Testament to do such a thing. And we're going by the New Testament. God hasn't authorized such. Man might suggest that everything that man wants to do is worship. We've had that come up. And they were asked, well, is changing a baby's diaper worship? Nah, it's an and silly. Why must we get down on that level to be able to teach a profound thing? To say, if everything in life is worship, then think about all you do in life. It's not. All we do in life is service to God. And I'd say a mother taking care of a baby, changing diaper, feeding, whatever else, would be part of her faithful service to God. But it's not an act of worship. Not at all. And God's His Word, if we'd respect it, tells us so. Some might suggest that all that man does is worship to God. And again, after what I've said, would we really want to go that far? So doing righteous acts, as to do righteous acts and do acts that are authorized by God, is acceptable to God. But good works of everyday Christian living is not necessarily worship to God. That's a very important point. We're not going to um, understand these things till we get right down to what is the nitty gritty about them. The next one and the last point I want to make is that only two, two of the five acts of worship are restricted in time. God has specified when we're to take the Lord's Supper, and that's on the first day of the week, Acts 27. We're not allowed to take it on Saturday night or Wednesday night. But in the worship assembly of the saints on the first day of the week, you cannot find and search it to see, but you cannot find in the New Testament where people took the Lord's Supper outside of the assembly of the saints. It's not there. And we act only on what's authorized. God has specified when we're to give financially to support the work of the church, the local congregation, the largest and smallest organized entity of the one church. And that's the first day of the week. And we're to prepare for that contribution throughout the week. 1 Corinthians 16, morning 2. So we must study about prayer and how to pray and the kinds of prayers that people pray. I think it would do us a great deal. I say us, I mean the church in general. It would do us a, a great deal of service if those of us who lead prayer were to learn the kind of prayers we ought to pray. The Lord's Supper and all that is involved in correctly partaking of it and the men who serve it, thinking about what we're doing and what we're saying. Of course, giving financially of our means and what's involved in the planning and the purposing and the con contributing. I'd hate to know that I was receiving money, but yet I was thinking, well, I haven't been profited. I don't have anything to give this week. Well, let me have that money, and I'll know I'm profited, and I'll give it, and you can go ahead and live on that and nothing that you claim you haven't been profited by. So singing is worship. was involved in doing it. If we're to sing, we need to learn something about singing. We need to think about what we're doing and the study of God's Word in the worship assembly when it comes to preaching. And thus, when we do that, you get sermons like this. <laughs> That's what it's all about. If a sermon doesn't instruct us in what is having to do with spiritual matters and becoming a Christian and living the Christian life, of what worth is it? I can get up and read to you all sorts of stuff. Or I could give you all sorts of things on political science. I'd like to think that one of my majors had to do with that. I could say a little bit about it. I could talk about history. I could talk about this, that, and the other. But it's not going to deal with your spiritual needs forgiveness of sins, and faithful living in the Lord's church. But this does. So worship involves certain acts on the Christian's part, which acts must begin with the intent of the heart to worship God and sobriety and reverence in holiness 
these acts are expressed to deity in adoration and devotion according to the teaching of the last will and testament of he who is the only mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. Almost from the beginning of man's presence on this earth, he has tried to ignore God's word and say something like, well, I just don't see the problem there. Well, Cain may not have either, but I promise you, he wasn't saved. He did his own thing, and he called it worship, and he expected God to be pleased with it. So when we have a proper study of the Bible, especially in the, such cases as I've called your attention to, such as Cain, we could go and talk about Nadab and Abihu, that offered strange fire under the Levitical order of things, which means it was strange to what the law of Moses taught, we ought to make it very clear that we cannot worship God as we please, as it suits us, or we take a vote on it, or with giving, without giving proper thought to what we're doing. I said in the beginning, this is fundamental. And I think sometimes you see after going through it again and bringing out those fundamentals and the particulars of it, that there'll always be a need, regardless of how long you've been in the church, how long you've been worshiping God, how long you've known fundamentally these basic teachings of the New Testament. We need to go over them. Because there's one thing that's characteristic of every human being, even those who are Christians. It's very easy to get into a rut and to let things slip. And we can't do that, not if we're diligent in following God on this earth and being faithful to Him. If you're not a child of God this morning, there is but one plan of salvation coming from the one Savior. And it pertains to believing in Christ based upon the evidence of the Scriptures, Romans 10, 17. Of repenting of one's sin, the resolve of the heart, the will no longer to be doing things that suit you, but from here on out, you're going to die to that attitude and you're going to be alive to the Lord in serving Him according to His will. There's where you die to sin in becoming a Christian. And then after that, you confess your faith in Christ, that He is the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. And to complete your obedience to the gospel, to be converted to Christ, is to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38, Galatians 3, 27. That's it. There's no more. And yet look at what these demand of the inward man of the heart in each step in the plan of salvation. As a child of God, then, we must keep our hearts pure. We must continue to remind ourselves and buffet our bodies and bring them the subjection that we might always abide according to the authority of Christ's will. That's how we prepare our character for eternity. That's how we become in the likeness of Christ. That's how we walk in His footsteps. And there is no other way to do it but to follow the teachings of Christ. So if as a Christian you've erred in that way, we urge you to repent of your sins, confess them in God's second law of pardon, and then pray to God for forgiveness. So if you are subject to the great invitation of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.